Okay, let's continue. So what we're going to do, do now is to kind of extend this model a little bit. Okay, to take one of these crazy assumptions we started with and change it and see the effect of that. Okay. Now, you remember this four assumption which said that uh, what did it say? It said that the executor always hit the goal. No matter in what way he shoots, okay? Now, let's introduce a certain probability for a miss, okay? So, we kind of take this one out and we introduce Q as the probability of missing the goal. But not to make it too hard, we look at a condition here that the strategy equals W. So, Still, if the executor shoots in the middle, he doesn't miss. On the other hand, now if he shoots at one of the sides, there is a certain share of the shots which either hits the post or outside the post. Okay? That's the idea of this one. Okay, uh, let's immediately explain the consequences. What will happen now, of course, is that this Q parameter must kind of come into this picture here in a logically sensible way. Okay, so let's uh, look at uh, the consequences and explain them. Okay, this is the result of this small change. Now, if you recall the previous situation here, then we had a 1 here and a 0 here, didn't we? And we had a p and a 1 minus p all the other way around. I don't remember actually. But you see that this q term has kind of come in, made changes in the lower part of this table. <coughs> the reason for the change in the lower part is that that is the only part of this table where the executor chooses his w strategy. Okay? And we only introduce this if the strategy is w. So there is no change in the top part here. That's as it used to be. So let's start by looking at this one here. Okay. There is a probability Q that the executor misses the goal if he shoots wide. In that case, of course, there's not a goal, is it? Then it's advantage for the for the keeper. So what the executor likes here, he likes to hit the goal. And in order to hit the goal, he has to have 1 minus q as his probability, because that's the inverse of missing the goal. Okay? And if that happens, then he gets his utility of 1, while if he misses, he gets the utility of 0. So the expected payoff or expected utility for the executor in this situation turns out to be 1 minus q. And that is why we have 1 minus q here. You probably see here that a nice thing about using a kind of 0-1 payoff structure here is that the expected payoff turns out to be the same as the probability. You see that? 1 minus q is the probability that there is a goal. It's the same as the expected payoff. So then we just only need actually to compute the probabilities. We don't really have to go through this mechanism as long as we use a 0-1 kind of structure on the payoff side. And of course, the explanation for the small q up here is analog. Okay. The keeper likes a no goal, so the keeper, he is not interested in a hit, that produces 0 for him, while the q, which is a miss of the goal, is what makes him happy. So we end up with Q here. <coughs> okay, then we have explained a half 
of the new part of this table. Let's continue and explain the final part, which is this slightly more complex expressions here. But again, this is not really difficult. Now if you look at the executor, of course, his utility is still such that he gets 1 if there is a goal, okay, and 0 if there is no goal. In the goal case, no goal. So what is needed for a goal to take place here? Okay. 1. The executor must not miss the goal, okay? That must happen, and something else must happen in that situation, because then the keeper may save, okay? And no save from the keeper. So this is a kind of combined probabilistic outcome, which we already have learned we should find by just multiplicating the two probabilities with each other given that there is no dependence. There is no dependence here, so we can just multiply. This probability is 1 minus q. This one is p. And of course, if you multiply, we get p times 1 minus q, which is the expected payoff for the executor. So how do we arrive at this other one? Of course, the only other option here Either there is a goal, or there is not a goal. And again, now we can kind of use that we are only interested in probabilities. So for the keeper here, the inverse, as we call it, probability, is the same as expected payoff. And the inverse probability is always found by simply taking 1 minus this one. 1 minus p times 1 minus q. Uh, two options. Either this happens with this probability, the other outcome must happen with 1 minus the same probability. That explains the upper part here. So we, s we, we argue for this one, and then we say that this is the other alternative. So it's we can simply find this one by taking 1 minus this one. Of course, again, we have to make some arguments related to the Nash equilibrium. Now it gets gradually more complex, okay? Due to the fact that these expressions here are more complex, then it turns out to be slightly more complex inequalities we have to analyze. Of course, the more we put into this model, the greater the complexity will be. <coughs> so we have to say something about this Q and how it behaves. Uh, maybe we can do that here. So, reasonable to assume that this Q is in between 0 and 1. Of course, it cannot be outside, but we kind of don't put an equal sign here. We don't open up for the possibility that Q is either 1 or 0. Now, if Q equals 0, what happens then? In that case, we get 1 here and 0 there. We get P here and 1 minus P here. Then we're back to the previous model, isn't we? So that's not interesting, okay? So P, Q should be different from zero. What about q equal one? What does that mean? Then we have to go back into our notes and look up the definition of q. I have taken that out, haven't I? Yeah. So what did I say? I said that q meant 
the probability of missing the goal. So if q equals 1, it means that the executor here never hits the goal when he shoots wide. That seems crazy, doesn't it? So we can kind of assume that that's not the case in order to establish the Nash equilibrium here. So this is this is obvious. Else, previous model while this is kind of too bad executor okay if an executor shooting wide on the penalty never hits the goal then uh, that's kind of too silly isn't it on the other hand, we will look at that situation in just a moment. But uh, this kind of gives us ammunition to find the Nash equilibrium. That's why we do it. So let's uh, briefly look at how we can do that. Now we can see here that we have to compare this one with this one, don't we? And then we do inequalities. We may just do it like this. We can take one minus q and put let's say like this okay and see what happens we just put it up and we choose a direction and then we do a little calculation here we can move that one over so we get one so we get q less than one okay and that is what we have assumed here so then obviously we should have a circle around this one when we start making that one greater than zero it turns out that this this expression is greater than zero. Okay, so then we can put the circle here. Of course, this square sticks the same. <coughs> what about this one? It seems here, as one should be bigger, we have the circle here, than this expression. Now this p here is less than one, isn't it? This is a number which is less than 1. What about this term? It can never be larger than 1, can never be smaller than 0, so that number must also be less than 1. Okay? So this number is also less than 1. We have two numbers, both are less than 1, we multiply them by each other, then of course the result must also be less than 1. Agree? So consequently, we have explained why we have a circle here and not there. Now there's only one best reply left, and that's this comparison. So let's look at that, okay? And we need a little space here, so let me take this out. Okay, let's assume that the inequality is as on the figure. Okay, so we start by saying 1 minus p times 1 minus q is bigger than q. Okay, that's the implication of how this table looks at the moment. So then let's just calculate a little here and see if we kind of end up with something which is obvious. Okay. We multiply in here minus p minus p times minus q is plus pq, bigger than q. Okay, let's keep one minus p here and move this part on that side. q minus pq, okay? Now you see we can factor this one, can't we? We keep one minus p and we put q in front of a parenthesis and it What's back is 1 minus p. Now we have already established that this p is like this, isn't it? That means that this expression never can be negative. Okay, it will always be a positive number. Then we can divide by it without changing the sign. 
So we can write this as 1 minus p over 1 minus p bigger than q. Then we can reduce here and we end with 1 bigger than q or q less than 1, which was the same thing we started with up there. Okay. And of course, again, we have shown now that this best reply is correct by a square around this rightmost expression here compared to q. So as you see, we have again achieved a result where there is no Nash equilibrium in pure strategies. Okay. We still get all this lack of combined circles and squares in a small square, and uh, it's kind of the same pattern we got in the simpler model. So these kind of should tell us that as long as when we kind of expand this model, most of the results should perhaps be like this. But uh, a neat thing about this case is that we, if you kind of look at the actual Nash equilibrium, and let me just write it up, it's a bit complex. Um, so let me just write it up here. This Nash equilibrium in mixed strategies turns out to be 1 minus p times 1 minus q minus q divided by 2 minus p times 1 minus q minus q and 1 minus p times 1 minus q over 2 minus p times 1 q minus q. This is the actual result we get when we make all these calculations that we do not spend time on here. If you look at this expression, it looks a bit ugly. Okay, it's kind of big and hard to see. But if you examine it a bit carefully, you will see here that what's under the fraction here is the same, isn't it? 2 minus p times 1 minus q minus q is the same as this one. So here they are equal. But there is a difference in the denominator, or the part above the fraction line. You see, 1 minus p times 1 minus q is the same as here, but then you subtract q here. So the denominator is, has a number which is subtracted from him, which must be positive, which means that this one must be smaller than that one. Okay, And as long as that one is smaller than that one, and these two are equal, the whole fraction here, if we call this, let's say, r star for this pattern, and S star for this pattern, we can immediately say that we must have something like this. Which of course is different from the previous case, where these two Nash equilibrium mixed strategies were the same. Okay, we got this 1 minus p over 2 minus p in both cases. In this case, the keeper and the executor separates in what probabilities they should randomize on. That's what this means. And this R was the tendency the executor had to shoot in the middle. Okay? And this was the tendency the goalkeeper had to stand still in the middle and not go for the any corner. So what this means then is that there is kind of a bigger tendency for the executor to shoot wide. You see that? Compared to the amount the, the keeper kind of stays in the middle. And we can look at the extreme case here, can't we? Let's, uh, let's say that Q approaches 1 here. Okay. We kind of don't allow Q to be 1. We have kind of made our model on that. But if we can kind of look at what's happening here, if Q actually equals 1, we can just enter 1 into our calculations, can't we? So if you put q equal to 1 in the top part here, what do we get then? So let's take this part of the expression, take it down here, and enter q equals to 1. In that case we get 1 minus p times 1 minus 1, q is 1 now, and minus 1 again. 
1 minus 1 is 0, isn't it? P times 0 is 0. So this is 0. And remaining 1 minus 1. 1 minus 1 is 0 as well, isn't it? So as long as this one isn't 0, we get 0 divided by this expression here. And you see that if Q is 1 here, we get 0 here and 2 minus 1, which is 1. So this mixed strategy or fraction turns out to be 1 if, sorry, 0 if Q equals 1. If we do the same thing here, we end up with this kind of Nash equilibrium, 0, 1. So in the limit here, when we have a very bad executor, we end up not with a mixed strategy Nash e equilibrium, because this is a pure strategy Nash equilibrium, isn't it? This is a prob probability 0 that the executor shoots in the middle. Hence, there is a probability 1, or 100%, that he shoots wide. While the keeper has a probability 1 of standing. So, we now have identified our first non-mixed strategy, uh, penalty kick Nash equilibrium, and it turns out to be such that if you have a very bad penalty executor, he is by the game here, forced to shoot wide, okay? even though he misses. And the keeper, he stands. And the reason, of course, is that the keeper, when he stands, he's secure that there will not be a goal by getting one in the middle. And as long as he kind of knows that this shooter is very bad, which he knows, of course, the, this information is kind of given to both players, then he, he forces the player to shoot wide. I don't know whether you have seen many penalty shootouts, but it seems to be a tendency that when you get bad penalty shooters, you know, when these penalty shootouts have taken a long time, then we see a lot of these shots which are kind of wide, often misses the goal, or are in a keeper height, if you like, and this kind of corresponds with this model, doesn't it? This is kind of what you would expect. The less good a penalty, a penalty kick executor is, the more he should shoot wide. That's kind of what this tells us. So you should expect that. So what you should say then uh, is that if uh, I don't do that, okay, uh, I leave that for you to, to kind of think what you can use this for. But then uh, you see there, um, we can kind of force a non-mixed Nash equilibrium by kind of tweaking the parameters here. And of course, the more parameters we put into this, the more of these very simplifying assumptions we kind of resolve by putting more different probabilities into this, we can get kind of any kind of situation, perhaps. So uh, this was kind of what I thought I should say about penalty kicks, actually. We have looked at two models, a very simple one, and one where we kind of do a little bit change. And we see that the two models produce similar results, but the, the latter one kind of also tells us a little bit more about how we should believe that bad, bad penalty kick executors behave. So they should shoot more wide than good ones. And that's not very hard to believe, is it? At least not when you have been given into this lecture. But if I have asked you this question before this lecture, maybe you wouldn't. Some feels that this is kind of counterintuitive. That the worse you shoot, the more wide you should shoot. You should kind of think it should be opposite, OK? Because if you have problems hitting the post, it seems like a very risky strategy to shoot wide, doesn't it? That's kind of what we see here. But the game kind of forces this bad shooter to shoot wide. Because if he tries to shoot in the middle, then the keeper stands there. That doesn't help, does it? Because based on our model, there is no goal in that situation. Because the keeper will be standing. This is something we also can test, can't we? We can look at continued penalty shootouts, especially those who moves long. Okay. And you can observe the keeper. And I would guess that you will see that uh, the keeper, and of course this is normally a good keeper, will stand more the longer the competition goes. Okay? So in when the shooters become bad, then the keeper will, will choose to stay, okay? to kind of go in the mid of the goal. And then, of course, he may throw himself when the goal, when the shot is, is passed, to kind of observe that it doesn't go in the middle. And either then the shooter is so bad that he misses, or the keeper, keeper saves. So this is, of course, the explanation uh, for every time England has lost in all these championships. They tend to lose on these penalty kicks, and we always see these players that come taking penalty number 7, 8, 9, or 10, 
and they shoot wide, either the keeper saves it or they miss the, miss the goal. Okay? So th this is the model that kind of explains that. I leave it to you to find out whether you can use it for something. Okay. But that's perhaps not the main point here. Okay, that was penalties. A few words about uh, some more advanced models. If you're interested in looking into this in a more advanced fashion, there is, I put up a paper here. Um, yeah, not here. In this uh, folder called extra material, uh, extra material in which uh, there is uh, an article which, which I published a few years ago, which is called Estimating Performance Correct Characteristics Through Observed Nash Equilibria. And this article, although the title doesn't indicate it, uh, discusses uh, penalty kick shootouts, as you can see. And this kind of goes uh, much further than we did here. Okay, so if you're interested in looking at more advanced version of this, you can simply read this paper. It's, uh, it, it, it may be parts that are hard to understand, but uh, the, the main points here, if you kind of stick out of the appendices, should be straightforward. This is kind of the same we have seen already. Uh, this we have seen, this we have seen, and then we move on here, uh, introducing some different ways of looking at this comparing this to other research on, on these uh, frequencies and so on. Uh, this, this we did as well here, actually not as complex as here. Uh, this we have seen and then we move into different models here where we introduce other probabilities, extra probabilities, a T here you see and, uh, and uh, then we use that T to look into something and then we look at this concept of prefer preferences of executors and keepers which I told you about where it turns out that it doesn't matter. Okay, so here we what we do here is that instead of having a, a zero one here as we had in the original model, we can open up for some parameters here and, and see that even though we open up for a higher relative payoff for the keeper, if he saves than the executor, it doesn't really matter. It produces exactly the same Nash equilibrium. Okay, so it's up to you if you like. This is of course not something you will be asked for in the Excel. Okay, that was chapter 3, or at least parts of chapter 3, 3, 1 and 3, 2. Uh, what's happening now is um, another section here, which is uh, 3, 3. Yeah, you see there is a section here, other sub games, corner kicks, free kicks and so on. It's just written something here. We will return to that when we look into some more exercises. As we probably discussed, these other uh, sub games typically are sequential or more sequential, like corner kicks, free kicks and throw-ins and that kind of stuff. But uh, what will be interesting for us now is to look at strategy and tactics for a whole game. Okay, so instead of looking at individual players, now we kind of look at teams. Okay, and uh, in football, luckily, there are two teams playing a match. And luckily, there are more than two teams playing a league. So looking at the league is kind of tricky from a game theory point of view, because then there are uh, more than two players or more than two teams. But uh, uh, single games are kind of uh, interesting as well as relatively easy to look at. So we will look at some single game tactics here uh, through game theory. Yeah. Okay. So again, we kind of look at the model here, and um, in this case, our lo model is not two football players, but but two teams. So uh, let's change our letters from E and K into T for team. Let me just take out some here. So now we are into 
paragraph 33 which is if you like games game theory on the team level so we look at the whole team now as a player or if you like the coach okay so this is kind of coaching in the sense that you try to apply game theory to to shed some light on some problems which coaches may have the choice of strategy the choice of players and that kind of stuff so uh, we assume here that there are two teams okay two teams we can name them uh, let's say t1 and t2 okay we can also kind of assume here that one of the teams is better than the other without actually being very precise on the meaning of better here we could uh, perhaps say that that means that over a long period of time of matches between these two teams one of the teams wins more than the other unfortunately that's not possible is it because these two teams they change so we really don't have empirical observations for one team which is the same the next time they play these other team okay they kind of change there are different players different coaches so these kind of this stuff changes all the time so we will kind of have to be a little bit flexible by the meaning here okay but we can assume that t1 is better than t2 and of course in general that's the case isn't it? it doesn't mean that t2 can't be t1 in a single match it means that over a set of a principally infinite amount of matches um, t1 will me mean most of them okay more than half of them so uh, naturally as a consequence here there, there must be some kind of uncertainty here related to match outcome this kind of follows from what we discussed here didn't it so it could be that any of the team wins a given match but we can assume there are some probabilities here which kind of is what we discussed in one and two so the consequence of one and two is kind of that there must be some kind of uncertainty related to match outcome outcome should have an e in the end So we have two players. Again, to make it easy, let's stick to two strategies, okay? So we assume two strategies. And we can call them for the moment O and D. It could mean offensive and defensive, for instance, but it doesn't have to mean that. Okay, this is just two names we put into this system for the moment. At the fifth point here, we can assume a simultaneous game again. We discussed this briefly yesterday, didn't we? That uh, the coach's choices here of strategy and uh, lines up and something is something which is kind of hidden, not given away freely. So again, this calls for a simultaneous type of game at this level here, at the kind of team pick team strategy level well, these, are, these are two different dimensions although they are kind of connected okay you can choose a strategy how your team should play by choosing a certain set of players or by choosing another set of players because there are certain players who are better in that kind of strategy than the other on the other hand you can also superimpose a kind of total strategy on top of this saying okay today we choose an offensive lineup but I want you to play offensively like this okay so this is kind of two dimensions but they are kind of linked together as well uh, so what about payoffs we have, we have some strategies here now we have some choices we have a simultaneous game you have to say something about payoff here and then we just make a choice and we say that we're interested in expected expected point score so we assume that there is a certain point system 
which transfers the outcome of the game into some numbers. Of course, we are well aware that we have this 3-1-0 three zero, three zero system today. We used to have a 2-1-0 system in football. And in other sports, they have some kind of combinations here. For instance, in hockey, they have a 3-2-1-0 system, don't they? So if there's a draw and one wins in extra time, they get two points. The other team get then gets one point. If the team wins in ordinary time, they get three points. The other team gets zero points. Okay, so there's a lot of different systems here. But the, the point is that as long as we stick to a system, we can always calculate the expected point score, given that we know the probabilities of these different outcomes. Okay, we win, a draw, and a lose. Okay, that gives us the straightforward option of calculating expected point score. This can be discussed, can't it? Because it's perhaps not such that in a single game you're interested in maximizing the expected point score. If you have, if you're involved in a, a qualifying match for the European Cups and have won at home, then of course you can lose by one or maybe two and you can take catch for a draw and it may be but that the strategy you choose is, is more risky if you go for a win, which is kind of the normal situation and then we would um, perhaps go for a more steady strategy where you don't take that amount of risk and that is perhaps not the same as maximizing the expected point score. Okay. So you have to be aware of this, that this kind of depends on what situation you're in. In a league situation, maximizing the, the kind of average amount of points you can take would perhaps get you to the highest possible level of the table. And that seems like a reasonable goal to have. But be aware of this, that there could be different objectives, really, that could make sense. And would change the models we look at here. Okay. Now let's look in the textbook on the table here. Here is the table. Okay. Now what I've done here is I've just fixed up all these combinations of these O and D strategies. Okay. Now they choose before the match here, so the team one can choose O and T team two can choose O and O and D and D and O and D and D. That's the four possible combinations that can be made. Of course, underlying this without being explicit, oh, it means that as long as you choose a strategy at start here, you cannot change that during the match. Okay, that is of course a grave simplification. Okay, most teams will have alternative strategies depending on what happens, and they will also use them. So this is a strong simplification. On the other hand, it's not so hard to open up for more strategies here as well, if you really want to do it, should we say, more close to reality. So again, just like in the penalty kick situation, we kind of oversimplify. Okay, but the idea is, of course, to get something we can treat and handle. So that was the explanation of the two first columns in this table tree, tree but then there are two other columns. Now we have said that there is some uncertainty rel related to match outcome. Okay, so we have to introduce some probabilities here. These probabilities reflect our assumption of uncertainty related to outcome. But it must be such, shouldn't it, that these probabilities they must depend on the choices of the teams. That's kind of obvious, isn't it? If Barcelona tries to play a long ball very aggressive type of system against a good team, they probably will lose. Okay. So that will affect the probability. The, their choice of strategy, of course, and their opponent's choice of strategy. If they play the regular system, which keeps fiddling the ball back and forth, then of course they get a different probability. So the probabilities governing the match outcomes here must depend on the different strategic choices. That's kind of the the whole point of this type of analysis. And of course, as a consequence, you see here, then we, we will kind of, in this situation, have to introduce one, two, three, four, five, six, eight, seven, eight possibly different probabilities. This P1200 then is the probability that T1 beats T2, given that both, both teams chooses the offensive strategy. There is a corresponding one here, P21, the probability that the other thing happens, that the other team beats the first one, if they both choose. And of course, that one plus that one, or actually one minus that one plus that one, must equal the probability of a draw. Okay? 
So P one two O O plus P two one O O plus let's say the probability of a draw must equal one. Okay? And the draw is of course also depending on the strategies. So this is what it really is, but we haven't kind of bothered to put up this draw probability here because we can always compute it given that these two are known. Okay. Of course, you probably know how we can estimate these probabilities, don't you? If you have a certain amount of matches here, you can count up the number of draws between Chelsea and Liverpool, the number of wins for Chelsea, the number of draws for, uh, sorry, the number of wins for Liverpool, and that gives you these probabilities, don't it? So if you, if you think like this, then okay, you can say we have, we have observed uh, 50 games between two teams, okay? In those games, we observed three wins for T1, six wins for T2, and two draws, given that both teams choose chosen the O strategy. If both teams chose the D strategy, there was one win there, one win there, and six draws there. So this uh, kind of seems to indicate that there is some kind of offensive, do defensive meaning behind these strategies. Do you see that? Because if both teams play defensively, you'd expect more draws than in other cases, perhaps. Okay. So you see there is a logic here. Okay, and then we can of course do this very simple by counting up the number of games here. Six. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 games. So to find this probability that team 1 beats team 2, there is 3 over 11, which is 0 0.27. This other probability that T2 beats T1 would be 6 over 11, which is 0 0.55. Okay, so you see how we simply can compute these probabilities based on historic observation. But there is a problem, isn't it? And the problem is, of course, that this history here of 50 games takes place over a long time period. And the teams are not the same. The coaches are not the same. The audience is not the same. The referee is not the same. So everything is changing. Okay? So the ability to use observed information to find such probabilities is not good. And it will never be good. So in that respect, we must kind of be careful with doing that. Okay? You probably know the record Norway has against Brazil, don't you? There has been four matches between Norway and Brazil. So the number of matches is four. And Norway has, in these four matches, achieved eight points. Brazil has achieved two points. So there, was, uh, there has been two wins for Norway and two draws. Of course, if you were to use these to estimate such probabilities, then Norway would be extremely good. It wouldn't really correspond with the FIFA ranking, would it? Not at all. So you see, there is a big risk in doing this without thinking. Okay, so you have to kind of s use your head a little here. But of course, you can use it as an indication. Of course, the more, the lower level you go here, if you go from a national level down to a club level, of course, there is more stability, there is more matches. And uh, certain leagues, like the Scottish League and uh, maybe the Danish League, there is a lot of matches within the season as well. So, of course, the shorter distance between the, the matches, the better the information is. Okay? But, of course, at the national level, there, this, this, there is four matches in the last hundred years. Okay? So that's not very much. And none of the players who played these matches are there today. Or they, are, they are here today, but they are not playing. Okay, so, so this is kind of <sighs> something that kind of makes this difficult. Okay? We kind of have to make some judgments, perhaps, on how to construct these probabilities, if we want to use it for something. Okay, then we take a break.